On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's Friday Forum with Howard Island, who is here to discuss his new book, written with Michael Jennings, Walter Benjamin, A Critical Life. Um, I think that, that uh, most people who are interested in uh, Walter Benjamin are aware that he, uh, he died as a suicide uh, in, at the beginning of World War II um, in, uh, the, at the Spanish border. So I, I earnestly hope that I'm not going to ruin anyone's pleasure uh, by reading the last uh, few pages of the final chapter of this uh, biography. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, pick the story up uh, in September 1940 in Marseille. Um, <clears throat> Benjamin is uh, waiting there for plans to develop for an escape out of Europe to the United States. Uh, he has a, a visa that would enable him to enter the United States, uh, which was secured for him by his friends in New York at the Institute of Social Research, Theodor Adorno and Max Horkheimer. But he does not have an exit visa from France. So he is forced to have recourse to an illegal crossing over the Pyrenees from France into Spain. Um, <clears throat> and he is now in Marseille uh, in September 1940, having left his apartment in, uh, in, in Paris uh, back in May uh, in a great hurry in order to escape the oncoming German armies, and, and having left a great many of his manuscripts behind, uh, some of them hidden in the Bibliothèque Nationale by his friend uh, and the librarian there, Georges Bataille, the writer of Bataille. So he is in Marseille, and um, for about five weeks, as this plan is hatching, and I'd like to begin the, uh, the reading uh, with a certain lunch date that he had during this, this, uh, this period in Marseille. So, by mid-September, the sojourn, as he had called it in a letter, the sojourn in Marseille had become, quote, a terrible test of nerves. That's from a letter as well. He was weighed down by a powerful depression. There are indications, however, that even this urgent state of affairs could not extinguish his intellectual fires or his playfulness. The novelist, the German novelist Soma Morgenstern, tells of a lunch date with Benjamin in Marseille at this time, during which the two writers talked about Flaubert. So this is a, a passage from um, Morgenstern's account of this lunch date with Benjamin. Hardly had we studied the menu and ordered something to drink than Walter Benjamin several times glanced at me insistently through his eyeglasses as though he expected from me some obligatory but now overdue remark. Finally, rather keyed up, he asked me, haven't you noticed anything? We haven't eaten yet, I said. What am I supposed to notice? He handed me the menu and waited. I surveyed the list of dishes once again, but nothing caught my eye. At that point, he lost all patience. Haven't you noticed the name of this restaurant? I glanced at the menu and saw that the innkeeper was named Arnoux. I communicated this finding to him. Well, he went on, doesn't that name mean anything to you? I felt I had flunked. I was not equal to this, this exam. <sighs> Don't you remember who Arnoux is? Madame Arnoux is the name of Frédéric's beloved in L'Education Sentimentale, Flaubert's novel, The, the Sentimental Education. So it was not until after the soup that he recovered from the disappointment I had caused him. And the subject of our lunchtime conversation that day was naturally Flaubert. In late September, Benjamin, accompanied by two acquaintances from Marseille, German-born Henny Gerland and her teenage son Joseph, who, by the way, later taught engineering at Brown University in Providence, took the train from Marseille into the countryside near the Spanish border. The prospects for a legal exit from France seemed non-existent. And Benjamin chose to attempt an illegal crossing into Spain, 
From there, he hoped to make his way through Spain to an embarkation point in Portugal and on to the United States. His friends in New York actually had uh, arranged for him a, an apartment on Central Park West. Um, in Port Vendre, they joined Lisa Fitko, a 31-year-old political activist who had lived in Vienna, Berlin, and Prague, and whose husband, Hans, Benjamin knew from the internment camp at Venusch. Uh, Benjamin was interned together with many uh, non-French uh, residents in, in France in the fall of 1939 for about seven, seven weeks. Um, Fitko was hardly a professional guide, but she had explored the possibilities for escape with real thoroughness. She could find her way along a path across the spurs of the Pyrenees and into the border town of Porbu, Spain, with the aid of a description she had obtained from the mayor of banyuls sur mer close to Port Ventre. From nearby Cerber, there was a more direct route to Porbu that had served many refugees as their highway out of France. But the Vichy Garde Mobile had learned of this path and were closely guarding it. Refugees were now forced westward, higher into the mountains, along the Route Lister, so-called because the narrow defile had, in 1939, provided the escape route for Enrique Lister, a senior military official of the Republic who was in flight from the Spanish fascists. Leon Feuchtwanger, Heinrich Ngolo Mann, Franz Werfel, and Alma Mahler Werfel had all escaped by means of this rugged trail. Fitko asked Benjamin whether, in view of his fragile heart, he wanted to risk the exertion. The real risk, he answered, would be not to go. At this point, the story of Walter Benjamin's last days becomes murky. On the advice of Mayor Azema of Banyuls, Fitko led the little group on a reconnaissance on the first part of the path over the mountains. Benjamin probably left Banyuls on September 25th. Fitko noted Benjamin's carefully calculated pace, 10 minutes of walking followed by one minute's rest, and his refusal to have anyone else carry his heavy black attache case, which contained, he said, a new manuscript that was, quote, more important than I am. Speculation has run wild as to the identity of this manuscript. Some have thought that it might be a completed version of the Arcades Project or of the Baudelaire book. Neither of these is at all likely, however, given the state of Benjamin's health and his only sporadic ability to work in the last year of his life. The manuscript may have been a final text of On the Concept of History, his last completed work that we know of, but he would have attributed uh, this much importance to the version he was carrying only if it differed significantly from the versions he had given into the keeping of Hannah Arendt, Gretel Adorno, Adorno's wife, and Georges Bataille. This, though, is only the first of the mysteries of his final days. Benjamin must have suffered terribly on the walk through the Pyrenees, though he did not complain to Lisa Fitko and was even capable of making jokes and drawing on his many years' experience of hill walking, helping them decipher the little handwritten map that was their only reference. I actually spoke to Lisa Fitko uh, in Chicago. She was 95 years old um, several years ago, about a year before she died, and uh, she was telling me about the, the walk uh, over the Pyrenees, and she said that, that the first thing she said was, he was incredibly funny. Um, so he, he really was cracking jokes. When Fitko, the Gurlans, and Benjamin reached the small clearing that was their goal for the, for the day, Benjamin announced that he would sleep alone in the clearing. He was at the end of his powers and unwilling to attempt any segment of the journey more than once. His companions, having acquainted themselves with the first third of the trail, returned to Banyuls to sleep in an inn and rejoined him the next morning for the final most difficult portion of the climb and the descent into Porbu. Fitko remembers the contradiction between Benjamin's crystal clear mind, his unbending inner strength, as she put it, and his otherworldliness. Only on one of the steepest sections did he falter, and Fitko and Joseph Gerland essentially dragged him up through a vineyard. Even under conditions such as these, Benjamin's ornate courtesy did not abandon him. When they had paused to eat and drink, he asked Fitko to pass a tomato. With your kind permission, may I? 
On the afternoon of September 26, they, when they were within sight of Porbu, Fitgo left the little party, which had grown slightly larger as they encountered other refugees, including Karina Birman and three companions. Birman's first sight of Benjamin suggested that on this, quote, extremely hot September day, he was on the point of cardiac arrest. She says, we ran in all directions in search of some water to help the sick man. Impressed by his bearing and manifest intellectuality, she took him to be a professor. Poor Boo had remained a, fishing, a, a quiet fishing village well into the 1920s, but its strategic position on the rail line between Spain and France led to heavy bombing during the Spanish Civil War. Benjamin and the Gerlans reported, together with Birman's party, to the small Spanish customs office in order to obtain the stamp on their papers necessary for transit into Spain. For reasons that will presumably never be discovered, the Spanish government had recently closed the border to illegal refugees from France. Benjamin and his companions were told that they would be returned to French soil, where they would face almost certain internment and transfer to a concentration camp in the Gestapo. The entire group was escorted to a small hotel where they were kept under loose guard. Birman remembers hearing, quote, a loud rattling from one of the neighboring rooms. On going to investigate, she found Benjamin in a, quote, desolate state of mind and in a completely exhausted physical condition. He told me, she writes, that by no means was he willing to return to the border or to move out of this hotel. When I remarked that there was no alternative other than to leave, he declared that there was one for him. He hinted that he had some very effective poisonous pills with him. He was lying half naked in his bed and had his very beautiful big golden grandfather watch with open cover on a little board near him, observing the time constantly. He was visited by one of the two local doctors, bled, and given injections in the course of the afternoon and evening. At some point during the night of September 26, he composed a note for his companion in flight, Henny Gerland, and for Adorno, the text of which was reconstructed from memory by Henny Gerland many years later, who had felt it necessary to destroy the original. And this is the note, the, the note that she remembers his last piece of writing. In a situation presenting no way out, I have no other choice but to make an, end, uh, make an end of it. It is in a small village in the Pyrenees where no one knows me that my life will come to a close. I ask you to transmit my thoughts to my friend Adorno and to explain to him the situation in which I find myself. There is not enough time remaining for me to write all the letters I would like to write. Sometime later that night, he took a massive dose of morphine. Arthur Kessler later remembered him leaving Marseille with enough morphine to kill a horse, as Kessler put it. At this point, the record of Walter Benjamin's last hours and the fate of his body becomes virtually impervious to historical inquiry. Henny Gerland later, later recalled that she received an urgent message from Benjamin early in the morning of September 27th. She found him in his room where he asked her to depict his condition as the result of illness and gave her the note. He then lost consciousness. Gerland summoned a doctor who pronounced him beyond help. According to Gerland, Benjamin died sometime on September 27th. Birman recounts that news of Benjamin's death caused a great uproar in the small town. Several charged calls were made, perhaps to the American consulate in Barcelona, since Benjamin was carrying an entry visa for the United States. As Birman's party sat down for a meal in the hotel on September 27th, a priest, a priest led a group of about 20 monks carrying candles and chanting a mass through the dining room. She writes, we were told that they had come from a neighboring monastery to say a requiem at the deathbed of Professor Benjamin and to bury him. 
The municipal death certificate confirms some aspects of Gerland's recollections, but not others, and it is contradicted at key points by the church register. Identifying the deceased as Dr. Benjamin Walter, it attributes his death to a cerebral hemorrhage. The Spanish doctor who examined Benjamin may have acceded to his final wish, hoping to conceal the suicide, or he may have been bribed by the other refugees who would have wanted to avoid the kind of ruckus that might lead to their return to France. But it gives the date of death as September 26th. The next day, the border was reopened. Before leaving Port Bou, Henny Gerland followed Benjamin's last wishes and destroyed a number of letters and, perhaps inadvertently, the manuscript he had carried over the Pyrenees. She also left enough money to rent a crypt for him in the communal cemetery for five years. The municipal death certificate records the burial on September 27th. The ecclesiastical record, however, places the burial on September 26th, 28th. Perhaps because the death certificate transposed his names, Walter Benjamin was buried in the Catholic section of the cemetery and not in the area reserved for those of other faiths, to say nothing of suicides. The municipal and ecclesiastical records again yield contradictory information on the exact number of the rented crypt, although a small memorial has been affixed to one of the possible resting places. A list of Benjamin's belongings, though not the belongings themselves, was discovered many years later in the municipal records, likewise under the name Benjamin Walter. It mentions a leather attache case, but no manuscript, a man's watch, a pipe, six photographs, an x-ray, he had a heart condition, a pair of glasses, a few letters, and newspapers, along with other papers and a bit of money. At the conclusion of the five-year lease, a new body was placed in the crypt in the cemetery at Porbu. Benjamin's remains were in all probability transferred to a mass grave. A memorial by the Israeli artist Donny Caravan now looks out from the cemetery toward the little harbor of Porbu and beyond that to the Mediterranean. So that's how the the last chapter ends. That's the uh, story of his uh, last couple of days. Um, so I'm, I'm happy now to uh, take questions from you. Um, if, if you have any, um, we'd be happy to talk more about Benjamin and other respects of his life. This is the, the yes. He's asking about the uh, Benjamin's relation to his colleagues at the Institute of Social Research, Max Horkheimer and Theodor Adorno. Um, it's an extraordinarily complicated situation. Um, one of the interesting uh, twists to this uh, relationship is that Max Horkheimer, who was the director of the Institute of Social Research um, in New York, had uh, earlier in 1924, when he was a graduate student at the University of Frankfurt, had uh, served as a reader of uh, Walter Benjamin's uh, second dissertation, uh, which was submitted to the Faculty in Aesthetics at Frankfurt in 1924. Uh, this is the, uh, as you may know in Germany, in order to become a, a teacher in a university, you have to uh, uh, write two dissertations. His first dissertation was on uh, the concept of criticism in German Romanticism, it's 1919, um, a treatment of, of the ideas of uh, Friedrich Schlegel, Novalis, uh, Schelling, and so on. Um, the second dissertation was uh, later published uh, in 1929 as the uh, origin of the German Trauerspiel. Trauerspiel means the play of mourning or the mourning play. A group of, 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 at that time, very obscure and still actually very obscure German plays from the 17th and 16th centuries, um, distinguished from the genre of tragedy. That was his second dissertation. Um, he wrote for that dissertation an extraordinarily difficult uh, prologue. 
And when he submitted this dissertation at Frankfurt, whether he intended this or not, nobody knows. But when he submitted it, the, uh, the man in aesthetics read the prologue and immediately passed it on to another department because he could make nothing of the prologue. He could not understand it. It was passed on to another department, and it was in that department that uh, Horkheimer was asked, together with another graduate student, to, to be a reader for the dissertation. The professor in charge, whose name was Hans Cornelius, um, found the dissertation once again uh, completely unreadable and incoherent, especially the prologue. And so his two graduate students naturally went along with, with that opinion. Horkheimer, uh, as a young man, wrote a report on the dissertation saying this was, this was not acceptable. No one could understand it. This indicates that, that the man would not be an effective teacher since he, he doesn't know how to communicate in, in, in uh, accessible language and so on. And so the dissertation uh, was, was not accepted. They actually wrote to Benjamin asking him to withdraw the dissertation so that he would not have a formal rejection from the university, which he agreed to, later regretted the decision tremendously and wished that he had forced them to, to actually go through with the uh, formal rejection. At any rate, Horkheimer was part of this rejection. And this is what led to Benjamin's becoming a freelance journalist. You know, he, he gave up his, his ambition to be, to be a teacher in the university. And, uh, and for about seven years, uh, was a very successful journalist in Weimar, Germany, until, of course, the uh, uh, ascension of, uh, of the National Socialists, at which point he was virtually unable to get his work published in Germany anymore. He published some uh, few pieces for the next two years under pseudonym, but it, things became very difficult for him. Um, a situation aggravated by his divorce from his wife, Dora, um, which he initiated out of a desire to marry his Russian girlfriend, who herself had a uh, a partner in back in Russia and had no intention of marrying Benjamin at all. Um, a strange, self-destructive kind of act. Um, and he was divorced from his wife, and the, uh, his case was so flimsy that the judge actually awarded his wife his entire inheritance, Benjamin's entire inheritance. So he was, he was in virtual poverty after this divorce, and with the... Uh, with the uh, Hitler's uh, uh, taking office in 1933, he was in really serious financial uh, straits. So this decision to reject his dissertation was a very, very crucial one. Max Horkheimer never told Benjamin about this. Benjamin, during his lifetime, never knew that Horkheimer had been part of this uh, decision at Frankfurt. And if you look at the letters between Horkheimer and Benjamin in the uh, 1930s, there is a strange kind of tension, I, I think, running through the letters. Of course, I, how can you not you know, keep this in mind when you read the letters? And um, I, I, I think it's there. Um, there's a strange kind of formality. Horkheimer certainly does a lot for Benjamin. Uh, in 1940, he made efforts to get Benjamin a position at the University of Havana. Um, and, uh, various other things and did, as I mentioned, secure for him the, uh, the visa, the entry visa into the United States. Um, but I feel myself that there was, there was, a, there was a kind of coldness and, and tension, as I say, in the relationship with Horkheimer. The relationship with Adorno, though, was very different. Um, Adorno and his wife Gretel were very, very close to, to Walter Benjamin. Benjamin actually knew Gretel Adorno uh, before he, he met uh, Theodore. And um, my co-author, Mike Jennings, thinks that they had a kind of romantic fling going. I actually, I don't see this myself. We, we disagree about this in the letters. I think that it was, it's a very kind of fond friendship, but I, I don't really see much indication of anything more than that. But Mike thinks that there was, and that this may have entered into the relationship with Theodore Adorno and caused some tension. Um, there was tension, certainly. Um, Adorno, when he um, got his dissertation, was deeply influenced by Walter Benjamin. Um, and in his first course as a, uh, a privat docent, a kind of uh, unpaid uh, assistant professor or lecturer at the university, his first course actually included an extended treatment of, of Benjamin's Tauerspiel book. Um, 
And his first writings on literary criticism, Adorno's, are deeply indebted to Benjamin. Indeed, his, I would say most of his work is, uh, shows the influence of Walter Benjamin in a very, very uh, strong and, and decisive way. Um, so for, uh, for many years, Adorno could be seen as, as Benjamin's foremost disciple, which is the way Benjamin himself once described Adorno. But then Adorno and Gretel moved to New York in 1934, I believe it was, Adorno became the assistant director of the Institute of Social Research under Max Horkheimer. And the, the institute was Benjamin's main source of income in the 1930s. It was his only steady source of income. And as I've mentioned, he was at times on the verge of, of real poverty. He was forced oftentimes to uh, live with friends. He lived with Bertolt Brecht for three summers in Brecht's house up in Denmark, in a little island in Denmark. He, he got back on good terms with his wife, Dora, two years after the divorce. Dora saw him at the burial of, of his mother. They had lived for, for several years together with their son, Stefan, in Benjamin's parents' villa in Berlin. And um, <clears throat> Dora had supported Benjamin for many, many years. As she was an English translator, her father was a professor of, uh, of English, a Shakespearean, well-known Shakespearean at the University of Vienna. And she grew up uh, with a very good knowledge of, of English and often, af often traveled to England. Um, so she supported Benjamin through translations into English and various others. She ran a magazine for women. Um, and uh, she supported Benjamin and their son for many years. Benjamin made very little effort to, to help, help uh, Stefan, although he, he, he loved Stefan and saw him, but he did not do much to contribute to his financial support. Um, so, so Dora was outraged by the divorce. But two years afterward, when Benjamin's mother was being buried, Dora saw him at the burial and felt sorry for him because he looked so bad, looked a wreck. So she got back in touch with him. She invited him for lunch and invited a friend, that, uh, a writer friend they were both close to. And the relationship resumed, not, not intimately, but she, she, she began taking care of him again. She had the greatest respect for him, for his mind. And she often said in letters that as long as someone like Walter Benjamin is alive in the world, it can't be all that bad. So Benjamin, uh, she herself left Germany in 1934, uh, having sold the villa, which she inherited after the parents died because the judge awarded it to her at the divorce proceedings. And she moved to San Remo, Italy, and began running a little pension there. She's a very good businesswoman. And Benjamin would often go down to the Pension in San Remo, this beautiful resort town in Italy, and would stay there for months at a time. Um, so he, he, that, that's the kind of life he lived in the 30s as an exile. He also spent two summers in the Spanish island of Ibiza, um, where he would live for virtually nothing in a room that was half constructed, would go out in the mornings uh, into the woods, where he had a lawn chair hidden away in the bushes would pull out his lawn chair in the middle of the woods with his papers and his books and would work there during the day, during the summer of 1933 and 1934. That's how he worked in Ibiza. He produced some of his finest works there, too. So anyway, this is a long roundabout attempt to answer your question. The relationship with Adorno was, was very complicated, but Adorno and Gretel, Gretel, his, Adorno's wife, who was a businesswoman and who ran a glove factory in Frankfurt, did everything they could to help Benjamin. They secured money from friends. They, they, Gretel gave of her own uh, um, you know, financial resources very generously. They were extraordinarily helpful and kind to Benjamin. Um, bent over backwards, in fact. But there are, there's also the, the situation in 1938 and 39 where Benjamin was working on his book on Baudelaire. And Adorno rejected the first essay that Benjamin wrote later called the Paris of the Second Empire under Baudelaire. And it was a crushing, devastating experience for Benjamin to have this essay rejected. So once Adorno had become assistant director of the Institute, he was no longer you know, Benjamin's disciple and sort of younger you know, student. He was now Benjamin's boss. And Benjamin had to kowtow to him. And he, he, he lorded it over Benjamin in certain ways. And at, at, as I say, the culminating point was when he rejected this, this, uh, this essay, asking Benjamin to write another one that he felt would be more theoretical. And Benjamin did. Benjamin came up with 
uh, on some motifs in Baudelaire, one of his greatest essays, I think. So Adorno got what he wanted. He knew how to get what he wanted from Benjamin. But he caused a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, of uh, suffering at the time. So it's an, it's a, it's a, there's a whole book there. You know, it's a really complicated situation. Yes? Okay, um, the question has to do with uh, the speculation about Benjamin's suicide or not. Actually, I, I, I was reading the, the last few pages of the final chapter. So you, um, um, yes, there has been um, a lot of speculation, or a fair amount of speculation about the, the final days, and doubts have been raised. In fact, even a suggestion has even been, been made that he was knocked off by, by the Russian government. Um, I, I don't. I'm not persuaded by this. We, uh, uh, Mike Jennings, my co-author, and I were in contact with one of the people, not only Lisa Fitko, whom, I, as I mentioned, I spoke to on the phone, but uh, Joseph Gerland, um, who was Henny Gerland's 16-year-old uh, son at the time of the crossing. He became, as I mentioned before, a professor of engineering at Brown, and I, uh, we, we spoke to him. He, he told us that he remembers standing outside Benjamin's hotel room when his mother went down that morning to, uh, to go into him because Benjamin sent for her to give her the note to Adorno. I, if you remember, I, I read about this. So Joseph Gerland remembers standing outside with the door closed, but he could hear, he says, Benjamin's labored breathing. He says it was really, really loud and really hard to listen to. So that is a pretty convincing detail that this actually is true that he took the morphine that night. He managed to keep conscious until the morning, sent for Henny Girl and gave her the note, and then lost consciousness. You know, he managed to stay, stay there that long, and he never recovered consciousness after that. So I, I, I think that that, plus Lisa Fitko's witness, I think is, is sufficient evidence, and in fact, good evidence, that this really did happen this way. And the other sort of speculations have to do with various kinds of anti-Soviet feeling and so on. So I'm, not a, I'm, I'm less persuaded by that. I'm much more persuaded. We can't know for sure, obviously. It's all sort of second and third hand. But, um, yeah. You mentioned okay. the, the expression self-destructive. And I think it fits aspects of his personality, even the preoccupation with this uh, uh, travel, uh, with this, uh, this drama of death. There were many options he had which he didn't avail himself. The, the friends, even to ambivalent friends, scared from children, asked him to come to Palestine. Uh, he could have left in the 30s when many people, Jewish and non-Jewish, left. They would be caught on to who they're dealing with when Hitler came to power. Uh, he didn't do any of those things. And so my question about him is this lack of practicality self-destructive tendency, but I want to put a broader net, uh, and maybe I'm, it's a stretch, but I wonder if you see any similarity or this coincidental with Karl Marx, who also had a Jewish background, a member of the Hecko family. If it wasn't for Engels, his friends and collaborators, he would have starved to death. Uh, there's a whole bunch of others who are basically ignoring the reality even for their brilliant people. And I wonder uh, what in his case was going on. Why did he go to Palestine? Why didn't he go to the Soviet Union? Why did he leave the country? Why did he go to the American consul? He had many options. And why did he uh, get so deeply involved with this manuscript? It's understandable, Central of intellectual right. But it took, as, as you quoted and correctly, of course, a uh, precedent of his life. I know he would have succeeded walking without it. But do you see him as a self-destructive person? In Indian tradition of certain intellectuals who are intractable, self-destructive, and many of them have to be Jewish. It's a very, very difficult question to uh, repeat and paraphrase. Um, basically asking about whether Benjamin is, has a kind of self-destructive streak. You know, he has a famous essay called The Destructive Character, written in the early 30s, uh, in which there is an indication of this. He stayed in, in Paris uh, much too late, much too long. Dora 
uh, his wife actually begged him in January of 1940 to come with her and their son Stefan to London. She had, a, she had sold her pension and had a, a new apartment in London. She had a room all ready for him. She begged him to come to London in January of 1940, before Hitler, a month before Hitler's ascension to power, and he refused. He was working in the Bibliothèque Nationale. He was working on the Arcades Project. There was, he thought, no other place in the world where he had the resources there for his book that he had at the Bibliothèque Nationale, and he was unwilling to abandon his work on the Arcades Project. So he did not take her very generous offer. Um, Sholem had early in the 20s invited him to Palestine, and Benjamin had repeatedly refused. Why? And, well, he, for, for a lot of different reasons, that's also an extremely complicated relationship, uh, the relation to Sholem. Sholem had demanded that if Benjamin come to Palestine, that he, in effect, uh, join the, the Zionist movement and commit himself to uh, the, the to Zionism and to the uh, devotion to the land in Israel. Benjamin was not willing to do that. He had serious reservations from 1912, when he was a student, on about Zionism and was not willing to, to commit to Zionism. Um, he actually deceived Sholem and the president of Jerusalem University at one point, saying that he was interested in going to Jerusalem and managed to get from Judah Magnus, the president of Jerusalem University, a very generous subvention that would enable him to learn Hebrew. And Benjamin took the several thousand marks, immediately went off to the gambling casinos in Monte Carlo, apparently lost a whole bunch of it. Uh, and that's whenever, that's whenever he did. That's what he did when he had money. He would go and gamble it. Um, he took Hebrew lessons for about three weeks. He waited nine months to arrange the lessons. He didn't thank Magnus until nine months later after he arranged the lessons. Then after three weeks, he abandoned the lessons, although he took advantage of the lessons to buy a whole bunch of books on, on Hebrew and, and Hebrew language because he was, he was fond of book buying. Later in the 30s, Sholem actually closed the doors to, to any, any uh, immigration to Palestine. He made it clear that there, were, there was no room for intellectuals like Walter Benjamin. So actually, when, when Benjamin became truly desperate in the late 30s, Palestine was closed to him. And Sholem, in his comfortable apartment in Jerusalem, sort of was saying, you know, buck up. St stop all this worrying, you know. Um, so uh, as, as for going to the Soviet Union, um, that too was not something that appealed to him. He was not interested in joining the Communist Party for a lot of reasons, mainly because he wanted to travel, because he was addicted to traveling. He loved traveling. And he knew that if he were to become a communist member of the Communist Party, his traveling would be severely limited. There were other reasons as well. Uh, he simply, for the, similar to the reasons why he wouldn't become a Zionist, he was not, a, a, he was not interested in joining a party and becoming a, you know, part of, a, of some line. So the, 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 the idea of moving to Russia was not really something real to him. He actually did not have that much available to him. The only real uh, s sort of escape route was the route to London that Dora offered him. And that he turned down what? because he wanted to continue work in the Bibliothèque Nationale on the Arcades Project. And uh, he, stayed, you know, he stayed until late May in 1940 after the German armies had invaded France in the spring of 1940. And then he had to abandon his apartment in a complete rush, leaving behind many, many manuscripts. Uh, he had a heart condition and so on. Uh, even as an adult, Benjamin could not make himself a cup of coffee. He was not a very practical person. So, um, but I do think he, he wanted to, uh, he did want to escape, and he did want to come to the United States. So that final door was closed to him as well. Sorry? Okay, one more. Yes. But there's a street, this was a street of mysticism in his writing. It's quite interesting. I don't know. The people around him didn't really have it. They got to get from Sholem was interested in the in Jewish mysticism. But he, there was something like that in him. Sholem's, you know, Sholem's approach to Jewish, to the history of Jewish mysticism, was highly rational. Yes. He was a very rational scholar, and it's, a, yes, and his 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 early work was in the philosophy of mathematics. It's it's a magnificent 
you know, study, Sholem's study is magnificent, um, and influenced Benjamin in very deep ways, especially in Benjamin's understanding of language. Uh, from, an early, from early on, from 1915 on, when they became friends, um, when Sholem was five years younger, um, Sholem's influence on Benjamin is very, very important. Uh, but Sholem was a rationalist. Benjamin was much more like a real mystic. And, and Sholem himself recognized, Sholem once, when he was a student, compared Benjamin to Lao Tzu and, and said that, that Benjamin reminds me of the Jewish prophets. He has the kind of spiritual bearing that one sees in Isaiah and Jeremiah. This is a man who, who reads the Hebrew, you know, intimately. So um, there is a very strong kind of mystical tendency in Benjamin, I think. At the same time, there is an extraordinary commitment to enlightenment and to reason, and to expressing things as lucidly as possible. Um, so it, it's this conflict or tension or dialectic between the rational or, or the enlightened and the mystical that is one of the things that makes him fascinating as a writer. He was and he wasn't. Yeah, he, there's, there's also great urbanity in Walter Benjamin. His radio uh, scripts for children and for adults, which he produced and, and himself broadcast in the, in the late 20s and early 30s in two German net radio networks. The radio scripts are wonderfully entertaining and urbane, witty pieces of work uh, from a man who is, is uh, thoroughly at home in the world. Um, so it, there, he has many hats. He has many sides to him. I think that's one, one of the reasons he appeals to so many different kinds of people.